Thank you for clicking play or the isosceles triangle. Uh, this is PK from the PK Comic Book 411 where I try not to do as much uh, reviews as I try to do compare and contrast and follow the artists and the writers. Um, information 411. Back for those that remember rotary phones, we actually did 411 to get people's phone numbers. Can you believe it? So anyway, 411 is information. What am I wearing? No, 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 Bat Kid, yes, leukemia, five years old. Uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation in San Francisco. So that's the Golden Gate Bridge, gotta love it. But not just DC, for the Marvel fans. Let's get some AOS going. Entirely too much, shouldn't have got it. But, eh. Okay, so, overview. We are in a very specific time. I don't know if they're really reboots, but we had the DCU, which they decided not to go with. And then you had Secret Wars that sort of tied in all of Hickman's stuff and the end of our universe. And then, boom, now we have all these number ones coming out. Now, before I go over the number ones, because there's 45 new Marvel titles coming out, how do you collect them all? I mean, you go through previews, which I do, for you guys to know the scope of what's coming out. And you go, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. And then you tell your local comic book store owner to get those. You will actually be reading number one while number two in the previews is ready to be listed. So how do you know? And all of them are gonna be graphic novels. Are they gonna be trades? It's 45 new trades. Or maybe the one that you wanted isn't gonna be a trade. So that's, that's where we are. Um, so I want to help you in deciding. Okay. So a quick overview of the titles that we're going to look at that have closed before the number ones have come on. Okay. We have the Secret Wars event by Marvel. Squadron Sinister spinoff, Thor spinoff, Ant-Man is now going to end and start this week. Uh, Magneto ended, Cullen Bunn's Magneto ended, Uncanny X-Men ended, Hawkeye ended, the Fraction, Aya, Aha, Aja one ended. And then, because it's Halloween, Nameless, Pisces, Coffin Hill, Blood Queen, Death Vigil, Witches, Roche Limit, Rosh Limit, Asylum, Dream Police, Dark Gods, Deep State, Birthright, Cowl. Then we'll go into the heavy hitters of Mark Millar Millar, uh, Jupiter Circle, Hickman's East of the West, Kirkman's Outcast, Warren Ellis's Trees, Jason Aaron's Southern Bastards, BKV Saga, and we stand on guard. Then we go to DC. We'll do the singles first. Wonder Woman, Batman, Green Lantern, Superman, Harley Quinn and Power Girl, Starfire, Batman Beyond, Earth 2, Justice League, and Batman Superman with my two favorite DC titles, Deathstroke and The Omega Men, which is now no longer six. It is a 12 part. Let us start. Secret Wars, number five. There's a long break between uh, four and five, but he's uh, explaining, you know, what has happened in the end and the beginning, the Beyonders, Molecule Man, Dr. Doom, etc. Um, perhaps a little bit forced, but we get some answers nonetheless. Um, Secret Wars, number six of nine now, no longer eight. It's a surprising intro to a, a main player at the end on this one. Um, and Pet Peeve, extrapolate out. They used it twice in there. That's almost like saying separate in because I'm pretty sure you can't extrapolate in. Extrapolate out. Extrapolating is that. Pet peeve. Squadron Sinister. Um, a little bit different than Animated Avengers. It calls them Squadron Supreme. Um, why they did that, I don't know. And then we have Jason Aaron writing Thors, which is the police force of Battleworld. Uh, number two. You have Jane Foster's Multiverse Killings. And then we have Loki introduced. You get to figure out who the baddies are in this one. Moving on, we have the last and final Hawkeye. Number issue 22, yes. It was a long time for Matt Fraction to get this out. Don't shoot the dog. There's a rule. You don't kill the dog. Though Fear the Walking Dead did do that. Um... Yes, so it's a wonderful denouement, and uh, I have it as a, a, a trade to lend to other friends. I, I really do love what David Aya Aha Aja did 
Um, I'm sad to see it go. And Jeff Lemire, who is like Colin Bunn, that is writing 10 titles all at the same time, um, it is still continuing. And I think he's going to start it again. This is four of five, which is going to be the last issue. And there's flashback art. Um, it's really neat how you know it's flashback and what's not flashback. And I believe it was uh, Walking Dead that they just did um, black and white as the flashback. Really cool. Taking that sort of comic intelligence and putting it on the screen. Edumacate the peoples. Five of five. Flashback. Still so good in this. And it leads to Old Man Barton. Um, so what else has ended? We have Moon Knight ended, I believe, as my favorite hero, that Colin Bunn really screwed this up. I think Warren Ellis started it in such a fashion that Brian Wood and uh, Colin Bunn couldn't. But you can tell when people are putting their pearls into certain comic books. We had a discussion about that on CBNAH. Comic book nerds are hot. 30,000 members on that group, Facebook. Um, yes, very last panel helped out wounded by a ghost and that ghost actually looks like the real Moon Knight instead of the ones that they did here. But that has ended. Another one that has ended is the Uncanny X-Men. It's supposed to be continued in issue number 600, but I have not seen it. Um, so 35 is now the finale, even though 34 says that it's, it's the to be continued is wrong, basically. Um, all right. So now, again, Colin Bunn, I really do believe his pearls have been put into um, Magneto versus his other ones. So I'm pretty sure 22 is going to be the last issue, but it actually ended with 21. We all know how it ends, but again, no spoilers. The cool lightning art was lost in this final issue. I, I'm really bummed about that. But Colin's on my shit list, man. Aquaman, em Empty Man, Moon Knight, World's End. Oh yeah, by the way, Colin Button and Tom Taylor were on, on the group. Is the only two that we think have... Um, currently ongoing series for both DC and Marvel. Interesting fact, there it is. And we have the Ant-Man Annual. There's a reference to Rage of Ultron, uh, OGN in this. And then we have the last Ant-Man, which is just, this, let's sneak one in, just do a number one before we start with the new Astonishing Ant-Man. $4.00. But Nick Spencer ties some threads together in the touching homage to Golden Era Heroes. All right, so that's going to be it for Marvel for now. And then we're going to go do some October Halloween horror. And everyone knows Grant Morrison's nameless. Got aliens and spines and fathers and daughters and asteroid temple headed to Earth. It's slowly releasing issues, which I appreciate because there's so much reading to do. But here we go from issue four to issue five. And I had to go back to read number four. It's, it's like a seance now. I don't know what is actually the truth. It reminds me of an Annihilator. Annihilator that Grant Morrison did. Really liked the beginning, but then like after the third or fourth one, he just sort of throws it to the wind and confuses everyone. Seems to be his M.O. I'm not really uh, a fan of that. And seems to be catching on because Curtis Weib is doing Pisces. The first one's about Vietnam. Second one's about Space in the 80s, and this third one, I believe it's number three. Yes, it is. Number three, he's sort of making a Morrison's nameless, but his own style, copying. Um, another one that has ended, Coffin Hill. It was one of my gems. I really, really liked Coffin Hill, and I always said that the way that she reveals it in her different timings, like 1970 or the day before Halloween in 1980, was ingenious. Caitlin Kittridge, awesome name. Um, so this is a big issue about the ice fisher, but what was once genius reveals is now sort of time popping, and it sort of confused the realers. Now I'm not, I know it's not a big seller, and it stopped. And it was supposed to go to 21, and now it's uh, stopped at 20. Um, it's a new arc on this one, so few. Um, and I had a sneaking suspicion that there was a Coffin Hill ancestor sort of inf uh, influencing Lorelai Smith. Then, story so far is in here with like a chart, a family chart. And it's like, ah, she's trying to make the readers a little bit more conducive to the next arc. Wonderful tie-ins and flashbacks. So she's trying to get new readers up to speed on the new arc. But here we have Haunted Houses Part 2, and it's an end. And 
the tie-ins and the retcons from issue number one. I'm going, God, how many months ago was that, right? And I'm trying to keep track. And here's another pet peeve. I wish I was. No. I wish I were. I wish he were. I wish he was. No. Were. I don't know what grammatically you call that. It's just another pet peeve, like separate in. Unless someone else can separate out and in. Can you separate in? Separate out? See what I mean? Uh, confusion comes down to this issue, and we have murder case and witchy plots. It's it's tough, and it says to be continued. And then Eve finally goes to confront Emma at the coffin house. It's you can see that she's trying to tie it up together, but there really should have been like a like a police report on the wall that gave all the names because it's just confusing the readers. It got too confusing. And as a small seller, you really shouldn't be confusing your audience, unless you're Grant Morrison, right? So, all of a sudden, somebody noticed this went from three to four bucks. So why? Why would you do that? You know you're going to get canceled. You're trying to eke it out or say I was going to make this amount of money to Vertigo. And so, boom. I, I don't know. I don't know. So here's the final issue. It's still four bucks. And the one thing I have to say about this, trying to Google it, not, en not enough people read it. But at the end, she goes, oh, yeah, your name's David, but I, but I called you Sam to protect you. It's like, dude, what? <laughs> who, the, who the hell is Sam? I mean, does that mean anything? Uh, having read 20 issues, keeping track, and having that sort of like my diamond in the rough gem that people don't know about, ending it with, yeah, but I named you Sam, even though your name's David. I didn't like that ending. On with the horror Death Visual, sort of horror, more of a family comic. We love Stefan Szczek, right? Croatian guy? He's doing great. But on this one, which is the last one, he had to do the big fight. And to me, it was sort of lost. There was, there was a very big delay between it. I think he had some health problems. But when it's 8 of 8, you have to do the, the big fight. And I don't know. It's... It was sort of a letdown, but he had to do it, so no, no harm, no foul. Um, Blood Queen by Dynamite. I try to have at least one from all of the different uh, uh, publishers, right? And this is by Dynamite. And what really attracted me to this was uh, how they really went to old-timey languages. I really thought that was cool. Um, the Troy Brownfield said that they don't want to meet expectations. They want to leave them in the dust. Sort of slow pacing. They did have a Rain and Blood uh, Slayer reference, which is, for this metalhead, it's pretty damn cool. Um, issue number two is a variant cover. And there's the Daughters of the Line that are learning all of the magic and healers and stuff. But a couple of them are doing blood magic, right? Uh, issue number three. So now there's a history uh, of the blood magic ban. Again, slow pace, but really nice panels. Ambush the King on this one. There's blood magic going on. So now you have an investigator going through the blood magic. And at this point, Game of Thrones. All the different factions. The dialogue and the meetings. This is the number... This is the annual, right? So then they did a 35 years uh, flashback about um, the War of the Witches and why they banned um, blood magic. Final issue. Yes, number six. No spoilers but ends with her pondering what to take over next. The next Blood Queen by Dynamite, I think is Blood Queen and Vampires, or Dracula. So the reason why I got the singles, I don't know if Dynamite's gonna do a trade on that. And that's another thing I should point out. When I know something's going to be graphic novel trade, I will try to get it to the shelves and deal less with the singles. There is one anomaly, and that's Scott Snyder's Witches, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, another thing that ended, so that was a six-part series, Blood Queen on Dynamite, and IDW, God, if you play Baldur's Gate, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and Jim Zub does all the Pathfinders. He's like the D&D &D writer, Jim Zub. Um, and it was, I mean, Minsk, come on, he, with the alien hamster. If you know what I'm talking about, you're going, no way. So this is a five-part series. It's fun. It's awesome. I wish they had a, a trader hardcover in it. I, I just love having that sort of retcon to me, playing the three-quarter. It wasn't even FPS. It was that three-quarter one that you have your little guys going up and down with the little circles. 
Love Baldur Gate. Um, right, so another one that will be ended on issue five is Rosh Limit, not Roche. This is three, and this is four. Four. <laughs> but I tell you what, the first one, which I think it was eight or nine issues, and it's available on trade, was really, really cool. This one is supposed to be 25 years later, and it's really a remake of Ridley Scott's Aliens. I mean, it's so much like it. It's like, come on, man. I was sort of ticked. Clandestiny. So that's one of five. I don't have five yet. I think it came out last week. And then they're going to go to another one, and it's a three-part uh, Rosh Limit. By the way, Rosh Limit is... If you had the gravity of a planet here and the gravity of a planet here and it's getting closer at some point this is going to break down and all go to the center of this planet right you with me on that because this has a bigger gravity the rosh limit is that limit that this planet stops orbiting and starts breaking apart knowledge with a k um let's go to asylum this is storm king actually let me back up i want to talk about witches i put this on the side. And I'm just like, right, one, four, up to five. They stopped at six, get the trade out, and they're going to come back. I, I mean, I think it's been a year. It has been a year. Came out like last Halloween. Scott Snyder put his pearls in there. Colin Bunn put it to Magneto. Jeff Lemire probably to the all-new Hawkeye. But Scott Snyder doing all the Batman. Witches with a Y. Tagline would be, the witches that we know about, brooms and whatnot, those are the ones that worship the witches with a Y, that are old, primordial, um, evil, as all get out, but they promise you anything if you pledge a person. I pledge you, they go get it, and then they give me whatever I want. It's a deeply personal book to Snyder. This actually stems from his youth at a cabin where he saw something sort of funky and then scared him, bejesus out of him, and that's where he's getting a lot of, of his, his material. Um, the thing that happened, though, is he wrote some letters in the back, as a lot of them do in the first issue, and then you get letter columns later on. These letters in the back is probably some of the coolest things, things that I've read in a comic book in a while, and you're not going to get it in a trade, are you? No. You have to get the singles. So, pulls no punches here. He introduces the baddies up front. It's unlike Outcast, that's sort of like a screenplay, and it's sort of, you can see that it's made for someone to read, and the director of photography is going to have certain angles with the, with the small little captions and stuff. Uh, yeah, the inserts, if you will. That's a, you know, inserts or cut-ins is what they would say, acting-wise. Oh, by the way, I did not get the Steve Jobs movie. If you watch the Steve Jobs movie, Aaron Sorkin's, uh, you see a guy with a gray goatee. I was almost that part. And I just had a movie audition, a tape, home recorded tape audition that I sent in. These help that, people. Me talking to you, just doing this, seeing how I move, framing it out. That, ho that helps me in these auditions. We'll see. It's the blonde-haired Kurt Russell lot. Let's move on. All right, pulls no punches here. Uh, he didn't wait for, like, sales to come in and then go to issue five. Again, he's writing these things in the back, these letters. So personal, right? Um... And I don't like confusing books. And a lot of times they, they put like a watercolor spread over it and I'm sort of squinting at the art going, exactly what is he showing me here? And I think exactly that's what he wants us to do. I'm reading between the lines, but if you're looking at like, I don't know, is that a person? I don't, and it's sort of, you can't tell. I think that's what he wants. Not sure, just, just a guess. 90,000 copies. He was just overjoyed and stunned that this, 90,000 copies, Number one, and he mentions that in the back of his letter. Number three. All right. Great pacing. Thank you. Now, this one was four. If you want to know, DC people, listen up. If you want to know why he writes so much Batman, it's because of a story at camp in his underwear. I'll leave it at that. Issue five, I need six. Issue five. All I can say 
Well, first, in, in terms of the actual story, the dad's a badass. He's going to go get his girl. You're rooting for him. Um, there's nothing clandestine about the dad and, and him trying to get his daughter. Um, some weird things happen with the mother. Uh, the reveals are not overdrawn. It's, it's, he's revealing it in a way that's keeping you active. So that's good. But in issue five. He gives a story about him working at Disney Parks, that he was a custodian, and then it actually moved up uh, to a character play, you know, wearing the costumes, etc. Um, and I have, I have a fellow actor that I was in stage play with, that was Mr. Mayor, musical the musical, at Whoville. And he actually works in Florida. And I sent him this, and he goes, that does not happen anymore. I'm not going to spoil it. Issue 5, letters in the back, awesome visual. Thank you, Scott, Mr. Snyder. For sharing that with us. Now, on to a different publisher. We have Storm King Asylum. Still with the horror theme here. I'm not really a horror buff, by the way. So, yeah, John Comforter. He's done The Thing, Escape from New York, Big Trouble in Little China, Kurt Russell, right? Um, also did Starman, Prince of Darkness, The Fog, and he married Sandy King, Sandra King, who is now basically in charge of this. This is about Lilith. Lilith, I remember from pen and paper D&D. Um, so art was, uh, I used to say that this would be the best art in any comic, but Clayton Crane, who does Rye and Savior. This is some of the best art I have seen anywhere. There must be some sort of actual digital art and hand art that he puts together. It's absolutely amazing. The story, we'll see what happens. But here's issue three. Issue four. The reporter's closing in on this. Pacing, the art, the story, suspense, all thumbs up. Uh, why this is red, I don't know. It's getting a little bit political on this issue. But uh, I swear, it's it's something else. Clayton Crane, he also does Rye, Valiant's Rye. And the reason why I'm not doing a lot of the Valiants is because I have them all in trades. Okay, so I will get to those once I get through with the singles and I can say, I caught up. Can't wait. All right, moving on, uh, continuing the horror theme, we have Justin Jordan's Dark Gods. One through six, I believe, yes, one through six. It's, it, rem, it gets a little gruesome, like Justin Jordan's uh, The Spread, that a lot of people are liking. Um, the protagonist is an everyday man, um, so we look through his eyes, and Justin Jordan does a lot with Odin, which is this sort of... Um, all of our phones are connected, they triangulate, they can actually figure out what we are enjoying and what to show us on ads to basically impulse us to do things, and now it's sort of like a brainwashing. He's really big into that, Justin Jordan. Um, let's see, now we go to issue four. Symbols in this, and then, wait a minute, Tiamat, Tiamat D&D, gotta love it, even the animated D&D, remember that, Tiamat? I'm a big fan. Um, but it's a little bit too gruesome for my liking. Hint of Tech returns on this one, but it's the end of Volume 1. I, I, I don't know if they're going to have a Volume 2. I don't know if I'd go back to it. A little bit too horror-esque. But keeping on with Justin Jordan. You want to have the old-style X-Files? It's a new arc. This is uh, Deep State 5, okay? And it's almost like they did X-Files meets Men in Black on this one. Uh, Time-shifting bullets, totally cool. We, we know about Flashpoint, right? But awesome. One arc issues. So uh, bef unlike Moon Knight, which was one arc and horrible, um, one to four was redefining history on how we landed on the moon. This one is redefining the JFK assassination. Again, the Odin hack of all the phones and stuff. That shows up in here. And then... We need to get to know what's happening with the real John Harrow. My top five diamonds in the rough gems. Dream Police. JMS. J. Michael Straczynski. It's my secret gem. Huge cliffhanger on this. I think the last one was like March. So he's taking a long time to get to these. Um, but I got this. 
also JMS, doing uh, Squadron Supreme, hardcover, and this. And apparently the third one isn't in hardcover, which sucks. I don't know why I did that. Um, so JMS, really a fan. But Dream Police, it's, it's something else. I would definitely take a look at Dream Police if you want to see something that's apart from the norm. Another one that has ended, Kyle Higgins' Cowl. I have a number three extra. Anyone wants it, let me know. But this is the last one. Good art, mature story, cool map, and they even have a soundtrack that you can play while reading this. Another uh, one that we all know, but was initially one of my diamonds in the rough, is Birthright. Joshua Williams of Nailbiter, Ghosted, and Birthright. I won't say anything about this. You should just get it. The trades are out, too. Um, I've talked about that before. Let's go to the big hats here. Mark Millar Millar. Always have to say both. Jupiter Circle. I know that Jupiter's Legacy is going to go to screen just like Chrononauts, which ended up to be very silly, but if you have a, a time displays thing and you have to make sure that it's not all time and why me and you screw up the present, imagine if you just throw that out the window. That's what Chrononauts is. Starlight, Jupiter's Legacy, Chrononauts, all headed to the big screen. Really quick re reads. He actually gets pretty deep on terms of infidelity, marriage. Um, oops, same one. Uh, divorce, youth, what compromises, what true love is, yet another relationship destroyed by youth, Sky Fox is going to get pissed, but blood, thicker than water, brothers stick together, that's the end of Jupiter, Jupiter Circle 1 through 6, and I believe Volume 2 is coming out, um, East of West, this is where Hickman put, puts his pearls, this is very much like a Grant Morrison uh, Multiversity Handbook that he did, that is, I call it 15.5. It's in between 14 and 15. Uh, this is 16. We talk about the 2065 apocalypse. Endless Nation takes over uh, Texas. 17. It's official. Hickman has made a futuristic old wild west Game of Thrones. It's a really touching, weird part here. And he starts getting more into Death's Son, Babylon. Um, he has this visor and, it, and this little balloon sort of tape is his companion. And there was a time that he was throwing stick with what he thought was a big giant hamster or gerbil, but it was actually this ugly demon with tentacles. Awesome, just ingenious. It's really something special. Chipmunk looked like a reptile. They're trying to like toughen him up. So a chipmunk looked like this crazy reptile. Uh, boars had crazy tentacles so that he would learn how to kill it and eat and feed himself. A lot of stuff. There's a lot of morality going on in Hickman and showing how they're going to introduce death. Just amazing. Hardcover. Really big hardcover. Goes up from 1 through 14. Perhaps an Easter egg, but when they say, oh my god, this Widowmaker and this Mao are getting together, look in the back of the blue screen. Really, really, really big. You're like, oh... Because there was a little disconnect there. Really, really cool. So, the Union kept on sending over uh, peacekeeping missions, and they came back pretty much wrecked. But the President's left-hand woman went over, and what happens to Doma? That's in East of West 21. Outcast, yes, I'm going to say that it is well done. Though, it is so slow on the reveal. You watch this. It's fast. You, I mean, you'll get through these really 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 quickly um but you watch it and you get the feel for it and i i can see that there is definitely uh some validity into that but he's really writing screenplays quite honestly um introduces the devil in that one nine he finally is called the proper noun outcast like you are an outcast get to learn about him and what happened with his wife a fast pace but slow reveal good letters in the back jury's still out he's writing screenplays even the close-ups or the inserts like i said before that's what he's doing warren ellis the trees Cefalu and palermo in sicily craziness okay in my ancestry on the italian side the guys came from Cefalu, the girls came from palermo both of them are in here 
then was crazy enough is that she goes over to the, like the, the top of certain islands in Scotland and driving a white Range Rover, which I have a really old white Range Rover. So, uh, Warren Ellis, man, are you, are you following me? Or, I mean, what's, what's going on? I would love to talk about that. Pretty crazy. If there's a golden retriever in the next issue, I am going to get in contact with Warren Ellis. And this is all about the poppies now. The black poppies. Because now the actual trees. The aliens came down, put the trees in there from somewhere, and they did nothing. Like, we were just ants. Like, whatever, humans. But now they actually did something, and they're trying to figure out what the black poppies are doing. Um... Before my camera runs out, and I haven't even gotten to the DC, I want to show you, this is the one that everyone should be reading. And in fact, it won the Harvey Award. Comic, comic People Making Comics uh, Awards. Southern Bastards, best new series. It's amazing. The one-arc issues are fantastic. And this is where Jason Aaron puts all of his pearls, though he's doing Thors and all the rest of them, right? Um, each one is just giving you... Number nine. Even if I haven't read any of the other issues, this is standalone as a remarkable tale. I mean, the reveal is just amazing. And it will be a TV show, I hear. Um, shifts from uh, the sheriff to Esau. Has some religious overtones. And he, uh, Latour, Jason Latour, talks about the uh, Confederate flag, because that was happening currently. Just pearls. Single issues. Amazing. The delivery and the layout. Ugh. So good. BKV, I can't believe Saga is still good. I mean, the turn the page and the aha moments are still happening. It's amazing. Um, it's the right mix of everything. Action, history, family, death, sex, witty banter, gruesome adventure. Reunition, reunitement finally happens here. I think the fifth trade is coming out. And Brian K. Vaughn is also writing, We Stand on Guard. This is issue number two and three. Um, it was supposed to be an ongoing, but now he has changed it to six. And I wonder is if that's because of sales or not. Which stemmed uh, a Facebook group conversation of, how do you know? Fade Out went to now 12, and we have Omega Man at, at 12. Um, after a popular demand, it stopped at six. But how do you know? And you really don't. You just need to like watch someone like me or keep on looking on, on comic list to see if there, there's a change. Uh, previews does pretty well now when it says final issue and stuff. But this was going to go into a pile of why is it doing so well? It's sort of like Outcast. Is it really just because of the writer? If it was a different writer, would We Stand on Guard be such a big seller? I don't know. But it's not the art. It's not the theme. Well, it could be the theme. The theme is that U.S. as a retaliatory measure is now after Canada, specifically because of the water. That's pretty cool. But this particular issue, it is very special to me because of acting. I try to explain to people, if they give you a script and you memorize that script and you show up to do that script, invariably they will give you a change or a different script or even a different part just to see how good you are at changing at a moment's notice. The way that I illustrate that is, okay, Phil, now let's do it like you're drowning. Okay, let me take a second to adjust. All right. Okay, that was good. Now let's do it like you're on fire. All right. Okay, adjust. Okay, Phil, that was great. Now let's do it like you're drowning on fire. And that's when I said, you know, fuck you. <laughs> Not really. But if you want to know exactly what I'm talking about, somehow BKV knew about that. That's what that is. So that particular issue is near and dear to my heart. Moving on to DC. And you know what? If you, if you are this far along with me after 35 minutes or so, I'll tell you what. How about an Easter egg? Something that you can't get on the shelves. It's an exclusive, East of West, that you can only get at the Image Expo, East of West. I will send this to your local comic book store. Easter egg. Moving on to DC. DCU was their big new format. And this is after Convergence. And there is the... The two shots with a little bit of divergent at the end. 
and it was going to be their new launch, and they scrapped it. Um, we have uh, first Wednesdays, we have a meeting of the minds, if you will, at a comic book store, and uh, they said, uh, one particular woman said, who writes a review column, I believe, well, yeah, you have DCU, it's supposed to be all about you and the breadth of what you can be, but they're all white heterosexual males. Uh, so maybe that's the case. I got Wonder Woman, <coughs> 41 through 43. Just to see the new change, right? It was recommended reading. New costume. Will I miss the old one? Yeah, I think I will. It's a quick read. Why it's four bucks? Yeah, I'm not too sure. And then I went to 43 and there's this crazy eye bleed. And you know what? It, it's a good story. I'm not going to knock it. End Finch. Uh, moving on to another one. We have Batman. I went to Batman just so I could see what I call Donnie Darko Robo Bat. And we have Jim Gordon inside there because Bruce Wayne is dead? Question mark? But this, now we learn that Bruce has amnesia. And the Justice League is trying to recruit Batman, but it's not really Batman. So we get to really find about Justice League through Detective Comics. That's interesting. Detective, Detective Comics number 45. You need to have for the new Justice League. That's going to change, I think, in 48. Number 48. Because Justice League right now is the Dark Side Wars with Jeff Johns. And uh, the art, everything. This is like... the. Five dollars for a nicer paper for this one, but this is uh, th there's a lot of stuff is going on, and that's the 41. Then it goes to 42. Really cool, wow, lasso part and Batman, which then leads to this, and that was just I was a drop jaw. A lot of people say, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of factions going on here. There's Anti Monitor, Dark Side, Superman, Metron, Miracle Man, Batman. Uh, there's Wonder Woman, Myrna, and Grail. I mean, there's all these different factions that are going on. So this is really cool. And then 44. This is epic. If you don't do DC at all, at least just buy this one. Just buy this one. Then we have Hitch's JLA, which is still the old school costumes. The new 52, I should say. Costumes. I mean, Aquaman is still an orange scale mill. That's pretty big. So I'm really liking the fact that at least Brian Hitch is keeping with the New 52, even though we know that Jeff Johns' Justice League after the Dark Side Wars is going to turn into what you saw in Detective Comics, of all titles. <clears throat> so, another recommended reading. By the way, it's uh, Roger Martinez in Phantom Zone 69501, if memory serves, and they are just DC buffs, and I love it. I love seeing it. So, recommended reading. I wanted to see what Hal, 2814.1 dude, is doing in uh, DC because it's Robert Venditti. And I know Robert Venditti from Exo Manowar. And they took him over. I know they pop around all the time, but he's a great writer. And so apparently what he did in Renegade is amazing. He gave away his, his uh, ring. He went for this old school glove with its own power pack on the back. And he went Renegade and got long hair. I, I was told that Renegade is so cool and what Robert Venditti is so good that I am going to get the trade of that. Going on with some more singles, here is something you should know. This is actually really important. It's a part two Superboy Convergence, but in the back there's divergence when Superman, who is now depowered, goes to the Fortress of Solitude and loses all of his stuff. The Fortress of Solitude is, hey, yeah, you're not Superman. I'm taking all your stuff. And he's holding on to his cape, right? And then it rips. And then that cape, which is invulnerable, the little baby blanket he had, he wraps around his knuckles because he still has super strength, but he doesn't want to, like, bleed and screw up his knuckles. So he always had his cape wrapped around. That was really cool. I'm not so sure I love all of this depowered stuff, but, hey, it's a different Superman story. So then I got Action Comics 42. The reason why I got this, he punches a cop in here. That made national news. So I wanted to see exactly why that happened, and it's definitely a bad apple cop. And without the background, it looks horrible. And I didn't like the way the news did that. Without the backstory, at least get the issue and read it before you put it on national news. So then I'm trying to figure out exactly what's happening with Superman. So I get this. He's human for a day. I like that. That's some touching parts. You know, it gets depowered for 24 hours, but now the depowering is starting to stay with him. So he's testing his flares, and he actually gets hung over. Then 42. It's very. I'm, I'm confused now because at this point, now he has his outfit. 
cuts his hair with a piece of the Fortress of Solitude. That's pretty cool. But the, the cohesiveness is gone. However, they said, DC said, okay, we're not going to DC you, but we're going to just let him tell stories, and there's no continuity. It's just, here's action, here's Superman, and here's Batman, here's Detective, and we're just going to let him go. Who cares? Sort of like that. Batman Superman, you would think would sort of tie it together. It really doesn't, but it brings in things from all of the titles and the changes. Cool new art team in this uh, arc, but there's this like underground villain. But it's basically new Batman and Superman as Clark Kent, because his name is now known. Sort of saying, well, who the hell are you? You're not the Batman. Well, you're not Superman anymore, buddy. You're Clark Kent. You know, you're not flying around. You can't save the day anymore. And, and Greg Pak is, is a good writer, a good storyteller. He's just not a prolific writer. Um, so again, the subterranean uh, villain. And now you have Aquaman in the fold. But here's a new arc. Okay? And instead of Batman slash Superman, it's really Batman versus Superman. And they're really trying to instill that. Um, no spoilers, but there's something about the Batman Superman annual in here. And all, I mean, whether it's the Lego movie or the animated, they're trying to get Batman versus Superman. And I believe that's all for the big screen because the movie's coming out, right? Uh, this particular Justice League, Gods and Monsters, is an alternate that you have. Batman's actually a vampire. It's, it's, it's weird stuff going on here. I really didn't like it. Sort of sappy hippie kumbaya stuff, uh, especially at the end. So, personal take on that. So, some lighthearted stuff. Amanda Connor also writes uh, Starfire. It's sort of a continuation of, of Harley Quinn, but I just don't know who is, who's it's for. I mean, is it, is it for girls? Is it for guys? Is it lighthearted? I, I just couldn't, couldn't get down to it. But for some reason, I keep on reading Starfire. And I, I don't know if it's the, the Car John Carpenter's um, uh, Starman with Jeff Bridges that he didn't understand the colloquialisms, but it's great because she always has this this sort of thought blurb, you know, what's naked eye? And then she thinks of an eye that's naked and, you know, unleashing the hounds. Sort of interesting ads, one guy's smoking a fairy. I just really like it. Variant cover here for October. I don't know why I keep getting this, but it's sort of like after you're reading all of this, when you see someone say, oh, you've been upper butt, and then the alien goes upper butt, and you have this sort of thought bubble of upper butt. I don't know. I just, I just, I guess I need that in, in the whole breadth of things. Uh, let's uh, go to Earth Two Society, which is the continuation of, of Earth Two Worlds End. Again, this is another one why I don't know why I keep on getting. It's Terry Sloan. If you're a big fan of him, maybe. Um, the cool thing they do is that this new world, this new Earth Two, has a red sun. And as that orbits, the Kryptonians get depowered. That's an interesting thing. And you're trying to terraform the, uh, the world here and goes awry. And this one is uh, about Flash and how he deals with fame and having to be at everyone's ready. Then the continuation of Future's End and another, re another one like, I don't know why I keep on getting this, but I, I like it. Maybe it's the art or the story or the fact that I put in so much time into Future's End that I want to see where it is. So this is the continuation. And again, we don't have Terry McGinnis. We have Tim Drake. And it's basically about the suit. There's a lot about the suit here and Alfred uh, and Brother I making everyone sort of cyborgs going after him. Uh, <clears throat> but... but there's some cool parts in this. I'm not going to deny that. Why they moved the four over, I don't know, but that's why I put the four here. There's a huge tie-in in here for the third Robin. So now he needs to prove himself as Batman, right? It's interesting to, to see the dialogue, because remember, this is 35 years in the future. It's interesting to see, see the dialogue of this that is actually the future of other titles. You're like, oh, well, then that has to happen, right? I mean, no wonder if... Uh, Dan Jurgens is saying, well, I'm going to do this, so make sure everyone's all ready. I mean, that would be cool of the continuity. But to the last two and my favorite DC titles, Omega Men. This is like DC doing image. And this is Tom King. Yes, Tom King, who is an ex-CIA operative, was co-writing with Tim Seeley on Grayson. And now he's going to move over to Marvel and uh, write The Vision. But Omega Men, it's... It's, it's wonderful fight sequences. 
and it was uh, to be canceled at six. This one's all about the solar history, solar system history. What happened to Kyle Rayner, OGL, and the art uptick on this is probably because we're going to go to 12. Fan outcry. You need to go to 12. So they're going to do it. Loving it. Lastly, another Easter egg. Something you got to know. Shadow of the Bat Convergence number two. Why would I want to get this? Well, thanks to Roger Martinez of the Phantom Zone, 69501, I believe. This, you need to know. This, you need to have for when Deathstroke gets his God Killer sword from Hephaestus. I would have never known. But this actually leads into this arc. Now remember, Deathstroke already fought Batman, and that's when I saw that splash page. And this is Tony S. Daniel, yeah, yeah, loving it, right? So I saw that splash page, I'm like, wow, okay. So now he's gonna fight Wonder Woman, although it's sort of, you know, they're not really fighting, it's just a miscommunication. Here's an annual, a little bit derailed. Dialogue is a lot of tell, not show. But then you go into nine, and now he's fighting Superman. Wouldn't it be cool if Deathstroke fought everyone in the Justice League? I'm, I'm the art, everything. It's it's quite amazing. And the God Killer Sword takes whatever happened to it, and then gives it back, you know, in fold. And Superman's not so good with magic, so really cool there. And we're up to issue 10, and it, I don't know why they're saying Lapidus. I think it was a mistake on the editors. It's Iapetus with an I, which is sort of like a Y, and a capital I sort of look like a lowercase L, so they switched it. Interesting there, right? So, now he needs to sacrifice a child or himself, and I won't give the spoiler, but he sacrifices part of himself in here. He uses the thought boxes to enrage the, uh, the god to win. So that's it, people. These will not be as long. I will keep them shorter. And remember that Easter egg in the middle of it, huh? You uh, post me a comment or PM me or something, and I'll send that to your local comic book store, and you get to have it. <sighs> PK Comic Book 411 signing off.